Hello everybody and welcome to my video on the Lomography fisheye cameras and we're going to go over a lot in this video because there are a few different cameras. We're going to cover all three models of the Lomography fisheye in this video because they are similar enough that we're going to just do that. So this video covers all three of these, the 110, the fisheye 1, and the fisheye 2. The 35mm and 110 fisheye point and shoots cameras, all three of these, have a 170 degree f8 approximately 10 millimeter lens in terms of angle of view. Uh, in terms of actual focus length, they're actually around 22 millimeters, 25. I was able to modify these without great difficulty for um, my Sony E-mount cameras. They have no light meter. They have leaf or guillotine shutters. Um, honestly, not entirely sure which type of shutter they their shutter would classify as. They have shutter speeds of instant, which is 1 100th of a second-ish, and bulb. So on the, the fisheye 2 here, you can see B is for bulb, N is for instant, and L is for lock. If you put it in L, you cannot take a photo and accidentally waste a frame. The fisheye 1, I think, just has instant and doesn't have bulb. I, yeah, that's correct. And then the fisheye 110 has bulb and instant only. The flash on these cameras, because, well, these two both have a flash, and then this one has a flash PC port on top here. These have a, a built-in flash, as well as a this one has a flash hot shoe on top. Uh, the flash sinks on these cameras at, at both of the shutter speeds. These are also the only point-and-shoot cameras that I know of that have circular fisheye lenses, and I, I believe they are the widest angle point-and-shoot cameras ever made. They are... They have surprisingly good features given the price of these things. On-body flash, and then there's a battery that's used to only power the flash, and the battery goes down in the bottom here. On all of mine, because I bought them all used, all four of these that I have had, the batteries, they came with batteries that had exploded in them. They use a single AA. So I'm going to go through each of the different models here in a little bit of detail to cover what they have. This is the 110. It's the smallest of them. It uses 110 film, which is this stuff right here. And I'll show you how to load the film in this camera in a bit, but I'm not actually going to go advance it all the way. This is my last roll of Tiger 200, and I need it this weekend for one more photo shoot before um, I, I do the all about film video on this. This is the part of the camera that holds the 110 film. And the way that this works is that, we're just gonna do this right now, that's right, it rotates like this. You take your 110 film, there's a little a little gear right here. Just slide it into the back like that, and then we're going to rotate that shut. And now, this is basically the camera right here. We're going to take off this adapter right here. We'll get to this in a minute, what that is. We're going to take that off. This camera does not like being taken apart. I always have trouble getting the parts of this camera off, and I don't know why. Always so afraid I'm going to break this. There we go. Got to just pull it straight out, not angle it. I think that's my problem. When you have the film in it, then, you simply load it in like this. This is very fiddly. I've never been good at this. There we go. And now that's loaded up and ready to go. So this is what it looks like with film loaded into it. It has here on top of it a viewfinder up top, and this allows you to sight up your scenes to get a rough idea of what's going to be in the frame. Honestly, it's not all that useful. This captures a whole lot in the frame. And so it does have the two swappable, swappable backs, the one, one here that holds the film, but also, if you take the film out, allows you to see what's going to be on the film. So I have it in bulb. There you can see, I think, projected onto the ground glass, the light from my cell phone. So it has these two swappable backs. This is the one that is really hard to get off. I honestly feel like I just kind of want to leave this one on full time. Ah, there we go. Okay, and this other swappable back is f for uh, th this ground glass is lined up with the focusing plane. So what you could do, I think, I think what this is for 
is just taking a picture of what's on the ground glass with your cell phone. I honestly could not find anywhere that described what that was used for. Uh, this also has a self-arming shutter. So every time you take a picture, the shutter rearms. And that's true whether you have it in bulb or in um, instant. The fisheye one is this guy right here. It's in brown. There were other colors. You can tell it's the fisheye one because it doesn't have a chrome face on the lens and it does not have a hot shoe and it does not have shutter speed, uh, shutter speed switch up here. So if we look at the fisheye two over here, there's also a fish here and a crab here. Everything's the same in terms of the location, but this adds, the fisheye two adds a, a hot shoe and adds shutter speeds. Oh, and here's the multiple exposure button. So the fisheye one has a built-in viewfinder right here that allows you to look through the back of the camera and sight up your scenes. Um, it has a flash built into the camera. No hot shoe, no multiple exposure switch, and instant only, no bulb mode. Also, this, these came with a removable viewfinder like the Baby 110 had that you could plug into the hot shoe here to sight up your scene. Oh, one other thing. A number of you asked about this camera after my review video went live. Uh, you'll notice some tape here holding this in bulb mode. And it says pinhole mod, 0.2 millimeters, 21.5 millimeter focal length. And if we open up the back, you might be able to see inside of the uh, camera there. Oh, no, probably not without me. There we go. Now you might be able to see inside of the camera a little copper circle. That's the 0.2 millimeter pinhole that I glued over the back of the lens, between the lens and the shutter. And then here I put in some um, adhesive back felt and then proceeded to melt off all of the flyers on it because what was happening, the first roll I took of this, I was getting some really significant glare, uh, some internal reflections coming off the bottom of the shutter box here, and that felt took care of that. So that is how I did the pinhole modification on my, um, my fisheye too. Okay, back to the standard fisheye too. The target market for these was the toy camera enthusiast. They, they offer a lot. If you enjoy toy cameras, they offer a ton of fun and usability that no other toy camera I've ever used offers. And I will say that the lenses on these uh, are pretty decent by toy camera standards. They are almost totally plastic. Now they're on the fisheye too. There is some metal trim here on the front, around the lens, and on the camera body. And there's also a little bit in terms of the copper, the wiring for the flash and the shutter uh, springs. Those are metal. But other than that, these cameras are entirely plastic and they are super light for it. The fisheye two is a bit heavier than the fisheye one. The lens here, if you do, uh, I did in my video review of these talk a little bit about the lens that I scavenged for APS-C and I, I don't have it handy to grab, but I took a completely shot camera body and then I, I, I took the metal ring off the front, slid out, uh, or no, uh, no I didn't, I'm sorry, I just cut it around the base here, I think. Uh, there's some screws inside, I had to undo those. I, I took it as part as much as I could and then I got out the hacksaw and um, finished the job at that point. So you can you can take the screws off here and then access some other stuff. Uh, that was a couple years ago, ago I did that. I don't remember all the details. It was not hard, but it did require a screwdriver and a hacksaw to, uh, to get the lens off. And then I did some modification in the lens because there were significant internal light leaks in the lens housing, just the way it was built. So I had to stuff a bunch of cotton yarn inside of the lens to get it not to leak light. At infinity focus, these lenses barely cover an APS-C sensor at closest focus with a ma with a focusing helicoid like I designed my modification with, it will focus very, very close and will cover up to full frame. In uh, when you get by very close, I mean you can have something touch the front of the lens and that will be in focus at the closest focus on my modification. From a creative standpoint, these are super fun to use. They are really, really fun cameras. Also, that lens that I modified for E-mount is really fun to use, and Lomography, if you're listening, making this for mirrorless cameras, just this lens, I think would be a pretty good product. Uh, as a footnote about these cameras, a lot of users don't take them seriously. Now, I have burned through four of these cameras now. 
all of four of them, I, I, should say, I shouldn't say I burned through, I bought four of the um, different 35 millimeter cameras, three of the twos and one of the ones. All four of those arrived with exploded batteries in the battery housing, just because someone would put the battery in and let it sit, forget about it, give it a couple years, the battery explodes. One that I modified for the pinhole had, had the worst battery explosion. It was so exploded that I had to go in there and dig the battery out in little tiny pieces in order to get it out. All, th all three of them that I, I salvaged, um, except the one with, with the lens that I took off, but the other three, uh, I had to clean out the battery chamber with distilled white vinegar to get the corrosion out of them. None of them work. The, ba the, the corrosion went up the wiring and, and damaged it. None of the flashes on any of these work. And if you get one that has it, a good battery chamber. The flash should work and that's great. If you get one with uh, an exploded battery in it, you can get it for pretty cheap, take the battery out safely, and everything except the flash will work. Oh, and the, um, the one that I took the lens off of, by the way, the battery had exploded so badly inside of that camera. Now the, the way that these are built, the battery goes inside of the film take-up spool, right? There's a battery chamber, there's a film take-up spool. When I opened up the back of that camera that I harvested the lens from, the film take-up spool had split right up here, and there was battery goo leaking out into the film take-up chamber, which is why it was that that camera ended up donating its lens. One other thing about this camera is that it lacks a tripod socket, as you can see, and um, a tripod socket would be very, very help helpful with these for bulb exposures. So if there's ever a fisheye 3 Lomography, hint, hint, tripod socket. These were made by Lomography in China. The fisheye 1 and 2 entered production in 2003. I could not find out when the 110 went into production. I believe that these are all still in production. They are at minimum all still for sale uh, new on Lomography's website as of when I wrote this script. These were preceded by nothing directly. Uh, these, the fish eyes were new offerings in Lomography's lineup. They're, they've been concurrent with myriad other Lomography cameras like the LCA, the Instant, the Spinner, the Sprocket Rocket, that one with the fluid-filled lens, and many others. Because these have been sold now for 18 years as of this video's recording. We're gonna go over now the camera's features. So as we do, we're going to start on the top of the camera. We do have over here the place where the, the, the wrist strap is connected, but here is the film rewind knob and lever that you would use to rewind the film when you're done with a roll. Flash hot shoe and accessory viewfinder shoe. Frame count window. The crab on this. Fish on the one. Lock. Instant and bulb. Shutter release. Shutter speed dial. Selector dial or slide right there. On the front of the camera, we have the Lomography Fisheye, I'm sorry, the Fisheye 2, the model here, right here, the lens, the flash on and off button, and the flash itself. On the camera's back, we have the flash power light, so if your flash is working, when the flash is ready to fire, that light will come on. Multiple exposure switch, film advance, film type window. On the camera's bottom, we have Lomography.com, the battery chamber probably not seeing that very well. Anyway, you might be able to see that it, there's still some residual corrosion in there. Whenever you have a battery that has a, an exploded alkaline battery, grab a cotton swab and some distilled white vinegar and just start cleaning it out. And that's your best chance of recovering that camera's battery um, use ability because distilled white vinegar is an acid and alkaline battery leaky, leakage goo is an alkaline and they cancel each other out inside the camera. And yes, I do, when I'm using these out in the field, have to just grab my keys because I am not strong enough to slide that down with just my fingers. Film cassette chamber right here. You can see how you push this up to be able to insert film. We'll see that in a minute. That little spring right there keeps the film aligned as it rolls, comes through the camera. This is your shutter box. You can see that there are film, cur uh, film guide rails here that help keep the film relatively flat on plane. I mean, insofar as it's curved. This is your shutter arming dial and frame count advance. So as the film advances, it engages the sprocket and the, the turning of the sprocket is what advances the film frame counter and rearms the shutter. Or if you're do, doing multiple exposures, this action right here with the multiple exposure switch also arms the shutter. Film take up spool. 
Uh, this is the uh, a little spring to help keep the film moving through here properly. This is the film pressure plate right there. Uh, while we have the back open, let's just go ahead and load the film. So we're gonna grab our roll of 35 millimeter film. We're gonna pop the film uh, film rewind knob up and we're gonna drop the film into place. Now we're going to replace the film rewind knob just like that, just like that. Come on, there we go. Okay, we're gonna pull out a leader and this doesn't slide into anything. There's a little hook right there and on there, two of them on the film take-up spool. What you do is you hold the leader right here and that hook next time it comes around is gonna grab the sprocket hole. It should, it doesn't want to, it's almost did. Let's try holding it slightly differently. Still does not want to do that. There we go, that did it, okay. And all right, now I'm feeling pretty confident about this. So we're gonna close that up. Advance the film. Advance the film. And now that we're at frame one, we're good to go. Now you do wanna make sure, if you haven't already, that you take any of the slack out of your film by rewinding this in the direction of the arrow until you feel resistance. Don't crank it, that's a good way to break your camera. And the reason that you do that is to help keep the film tense so that it's flat when it's behind the lens. So we're gonna take a picture here and you can see the frame count and window advance. We're gonna do it again and watch the frame, the, the, the knob right here. Let's do this once more, make it a little bit easier to see. And you can see that this, this rotates opposite the direction of the arrow as the film moves through the back of the camera. Uh, and that's because the film's being taken out of the cassette. Now, an important thing to know about film is it is one and done. It can record light a single time in a controlled manner with a proper shutter speed and aperture, or in as much of a controlled manner as a camera with a single or two shutter speeds can give you, and or in an uncontrolled manner by absorbing all the photons that reach it by doing something like this. If you have actual film in your camera that is not ruined already, you open up the back, you will erase all the photos you've taken and any you could take in the future that are in this part of the film which has exited the film cassette. So, but I want you to see what's happening inside the camera when you take a picture. So I hit the shutter button, we take a picture. Now we're going to advance the film. You can see that the camera, when we, gonna hold it there so we rearm the shutter. Okay, you can see as we advance the, the t film take up knob right here, it turns the spool and that pulls film out of the cassette, which is why this turns in the opposite direction of the rewind arrow because there's a mechanical connection from the take up spool to the film cassette. You've used your entire roll of film, it's time to rewind it. There's no rewind button, you just start rewinding. You need to keep the film back closed this whole time, by the way. I just want you to see what's going on inside the camera. Makes a great sound. Then it just ends, the sound will stop, and you just wind a couple more times to get this back into the cassette. In real life, you wanna rewind this the whole way into the cassette, magically like that, so it looks like this. And this is a good way just to remind you that you've already used this film and you don't want to use it again. Then if you're going to keep shooting, grab your next roll of film, drop it in and repeat the process. Or if you are done shooting for the day, what you're going to do is close your film back, make sure your shutter is triggered and put your camera aside. You can safely open the film back on this camera once the film is entirely rewound. If you have one of the two models that has a flash, you have a hot shoe on the Fisheye 2 and a PC port on the Baby 110. Uh, with the flash hot shoe, if you're going to use a flash, the worst possible place you can put a flash is right on top of your camera. And that's because the light will exit the flash, it will contact your sub subject, bounce back to the camera, and because the light is coming this way, it's going to make your subject look very flat and waxy. So if you, have a fl if you want to mount a flash on this, you want to make sure that you articulate the flash upward this way. And what I don't know is if the hot shoe works without the battery. It should, 
because hot shoes don't need to have a battery to operate. They can be operated off of the mechanical action of the shutter. However, okay, so the flash works. Let's find out now if the shutter, if the camera needs a battery to trigger the hot shoe. It does not. So if your battery has exploded in your fisheye too, you can uh, still use a flash if you have it connected to your hot shoe. Now, like I said, the absolute worst possible place for your flash is right on top of your camera. So if you are going to use this, this camera, try to avoid a flash that's shaped like this. Try to get one that has the ability at minimum to articulate the, the flash upwards from the camera, okay? Now the reason for that is because if you think about the way that you see everything, when we are outside, the sun is above us, or at night, street lights are above us, indoors, the lights in the building are above us. Our brains are programmed to see things that are lit from above as being and looking natural. So you wanna replicate that with your flash. So if you have a flash that articulates, you can bounce the light up at the ceiling, have it bounce off the ceiling back to your subject, and then back to your camera, and that replicates the look of natural lighting on film. With a PC port here, you need a PC cable to connect to your flash. I don't have a PC cable here, but then that allows you to also hold the flash in your hands, which allows you a lot of control over how the lighting will be used with these, um, with these cameras. There are hot shoe to PC cable adapters as well if you really wanna go crazy using a flash with this camera and hand holding a flash to bounce the light off of the wall or things like that. Oh, one thing, if you have the working on camera flash, it is a rear sync flash in bulb mode, but the hot shoe is always front curtain. Now what that means is this applies only to bulb mode. In bulb mode, you push the shutter button down the shutter stays open as long as you hold it, and then it closes when you release it. Front curtain means that when you push the shutter button down, the flash triggers. Rear curtain means that when you release it, the flash triggers. So that means if you have a working on camera flash, you can achieve rear curtain effects with the flash on this camera, with this camera in bulb mode. Now that's really good. Let's say that you have a friend who's got a hula hoop, right? And you have put a handful of LEDs on it, and you're gonna have your friend take that hula hoop from their, their feet up to their, up to their neck and spin it around, right? And it's gonna spin the whole way. So it's gonna look like they're wrapped in these lights because the, the, in bulb mode, you push the bulb mode, they start doing the thing, the hula hoop goes up to their neck, and that, that those lights are gonna trace a spiral up them. When it gets up to their neck, you release the shutter, this fires, so now what you have is your friend somewhat illuminated and you can make out your friend with their hula hoop a little bit and then the line of lights going down them and around them. And that's, that's what rear curtain can do. So uh, the other thing, if you wanted to do something slightly different and not have their hula hoop be at their neck but have it be at their feet where it might not be visible in frame, use the hot shoe. Push down bulb, flash triggers. They bring the hula hoop up as they're, they're using it, when they get it up to their neck, you let go of the shutter, it closes. So now that would be a completely different effect. And that's uh, the difference between front and rear curtain. Okay, so now that we've talked about everything about this camera up to this point, let's talk about the mechanics of taking a photo with this camera. Okay, so this is functionally the same regardless of which version you have. If you have the, the sighting accessory, you can use that. If you don't, just kind of stick your eye over the hot shoe or the middle of your fisheye one camera, eyeball it and go, yeah, sure, that looks great, and go with it. What you're gonna do to take a picture is you simply push down on the shutter button and with your fisheye one or your fisheye two in instant, it just takes a picture at about a one hundredth of a second. After that, you just advance the film until it stops and you've rearmed the shutter. That's it, it's really, really simple just like that. Okay, so what about double exposures? You can only do that with the fisheye too. And the way to do, to do a double exposure is you take your first photo, just like we just saw, then you push the multiple exposure switch, that rearms the shutter, and then you take your second photo. Now you take your, you advance your film until you reach the end, and you've 
taking your double exposure. There's no need for a dead frame with these cameras because they use a multiple exposure switch and you don't have to advance the film or hold anything while you advance the film to make that double exposure happen. So these are really, really good cameras for multiple exposures. So let's go over some tips on how to use this camera, some things that will set you up to be successful. Firstly, this is a fixed focus lens. You wanna keep your subjects at least arm's length away from you. The focus is about one meter to infinity. Next thing is to use a fast film. In daylight, that's a 400 ISO film. If you're gonna be shooting at night or in the evening, you'll wanna grab an 800 ISO film and push it to 1600. Or even some 400s like Ultramax can be pushed up to 1600 and still return something. Anyway, um, you, so, so this does have a slow aperture. I think it's F8 if I recall correctly, and it's fixed, which means that you will uh, need a faster film regardless of your, of your situation. Don't use slide film in this. Rely exclusively on C41 and black and white. And the reason for that is because those have a lot of forgiveness, what's technically called exposure latitude, built into them. So with C41 especially, you can be fairly well off on your exposure and still get an image out of it. With slide film, you will not get an image. So black and white or C41 it is for these. I will also say that, you know, I've said in a number of videos, every camera has something to teach you about photography. This camera can teach you a lot about fisheye photography. It has a 180 degree circular fisheye lens and is the least expensive way to get into fisheye photography. So if you want to do that, if you want to learn fisheye lens use, this is where you should start. Pick one up and if it's broken, harvest the lens for your mirrorless system. If it's not broken, grab some film and start learning how this works. I will tell you, that using this as a film camera will teach you a whole lot more about uh, photography, especially fisheye photography, than harvesting the lens to use on your mirrorless system. And as I mentioned it with my pinhole modification, that's a very fun modification to do, to glue a 0.2 millimeter pinhole onto the back of the aperture for these. Uh, it does work really well, and you do have to use the camera in bulb, but everything from just a, a like a centimeter or two in front of the lens to infinity is in focus. And that can be really good for some really interesting creative options. Uh, so Lomography, if you're listening and sitting there thinking right now, hey, let's make a fisheye three, hint to hint, uh, having a an aperture built in that would allow a pinhole to slide into this in, uh, to repl in addition to having a, an F8 aperture, having it, giving it the ability to have both would be a really, really neat uh, modification, uh, usability expansion with these. So these cameras are really good at teaching a lot about photography and they make it pretty obvious what to te what they're gonna teach you. Fisheye lens use, patience with getting the back of the baby 110 on and off, patience with getting the wrist straps on and off. Lots of patience they'll teach you. Yes, if you're willing to listen, which I am not feeling willing to listen to that tonight. Ah, there we go, I got it. And I didn't scratch up the camera, that's nice. Okay, so these are really good teachers. They, they, are, not, uh, they are not unforgiving cameras, but they're not forgiving either. So they will let you make some mistakes, but they will also always give you really interesting, very captivating, and very enjoyable results that you can easily share with your friends and that will garner a whole lot of uh, interest, at least visual interest from people. Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera.